This is the Naked Genetics Podcast, taking a look inside your genes. The story of human evolution is long and complicated, but the simple truth is, you're only here because your ancestors got lucky. There was, hypothetically and actually, uh, although we can't say who it was, a person who existed through which every single person's family tree flows. Plus, we wind the clock back to the very start of human life and discover how new research is pushing back the frontiers of human embryology and a suitably festive gene of the month. This is the Naked Genetics podcast for December 2016 with me, Dr Kat Arney, brought to you in association with the Genetics Society, online at genetics.org.uk. Roughly 200,000 years since the first anatomically modern humans, that's our species, Homo sapiens, arose in Africa. And since then, we've got pretty much everywhere. Our amazing story is written into our genes, mixed up with genes of the other early humans, such as Neanderthals, that we met and mated with along the way. This genetic journey is the subject of a new book, A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived, by writer, broadcaster and geneticist Adam Rutherford. I caught up with him to find out about the story behind his story of our story. It's got a slightly ambitious title. It is A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived. It is literally true in a sense that what it is is trying to fuse older academic fields such as history and archaeology Uh, with a very much newer one, which is genomics. So using DNA as a historical source to compare, test, verify, debunk what we think we know about history using the genome. We hear a lot about all these things like, you know, 23andMe, you can get your genome done. People seem to be extracting DNA out of everything they can dig out of the ground. How has the the science of DNA changed what we understand about our origins? And, And how recent are we talking that this change has come about? It's not an exaggeration to say that genomics has revolutionised paleoanthropology, so the study of the evolution of of humans. And it's all really happened in the last 10 years and mostly in the last two years. So the first non-homo sapiens human genome was only sequenced in 2009 and 10, which was Neanderthal uh, from Neanderthal 1. So one one of the first three Neanderthals found, this one being uh, the one from the Neander Valley in Germany. And we immediately began to make comparisons between us and them and discovered a whole bunch of stuff, which included the the, the stuff that people now already know, which is that we successfully interbred with Neanderthals. Now, I argue in the book that that means that they were not a different species from us, which I I can I can defend. Controversial. It it is a little bit. And and, and I think the problem really is, is less to do with what the data says and more to do with our species definition. Um, so the, the, the idea, the classical, there, there isn't one single species definition, but the, but the most widely used is that two organisms who are incapable of producing a fertile offspring must be a different species. Now, the fact that we can have our DNA tested, you and me as white-skinned Europeans, or largely white-skinned Europeans in my case, uh, that, that we both have Neanderthal DNA in our, in our genomes, We know that because we compared it with the Neanderthal DNA that was taken out of Neanderthals. The the fact that we carry their DNA to this day means they had fertile offspring. So it it must have, they must have bonked each other, basically. Absolutely. I mean, categorically, we can demonstrate that's true. We we know of, initially it was only five, but now that number has gone up. But gene flow events is is what we refer to them as. Euphemistically. A little bit euphemistically, (laughs) that. It does mean sex. It does mean sex on a sort of grand population scale rather than just two people getting it on. Um, But we see it in many times that Homo sapiens met Homo neanderthalensis. We see gene flow events. We see it from males to females and females to males. We see it from um, Homo sapiens into Homo neanderthalensis, and we see it from Homo neanderthalensis into Homo sapiens, right? So that there isn't a version of this which involves the production of infertile offspring. 
a lot of us will have seen the image of, you know, the march of progress, that, that diagram of evolution that starts with the knuckle-dragging monkey, goes through various kind of heavy-browed, knuckle-dragging ancestors, and then arrives at modern humans. So that, that very neat idea of a, a tree or a, a progression, that, that's not right then, is it? No, I think we're ready to abandon that. Um, and I think we've been ready to abandon it for a few years now. Um, that, that was an idea drawn in the 1930s. And I, I think the fewer samples we had and the fewer, the, the fewer data that we had, the more confident we were about the, the, as you say, the march of progress is what it's known as. There are two things I argue are wrong with that. The first is the name and, and the direction of travel. So it suggests that ape-like ancestors on all four were somehow simpler than us and that we have progressed into being bigger brained and we use tools and, and the final one is a sort of bearded man with a spear so he, he is now um, homo sapiens and an intelligent version of what had come before now that's wrong right there is there is no direction to evolution uh, we are evolved all organisms are evolved to exploit their environment at that time so that we are no more or less evolved than any other organism on earth so there is no direction to the travel there's no inevitability about tool use, and there's no inevitability about having bigger brains and the intelligence that we enjoy. That's the first thing. The second thing that's wrong with it is we don't know the path. It seems to be more like a, not even a family tree, but this enormous family bush strangling yeah. thing all over the place. Yeah, that's, that's right. I think maybe also we need to think quite hard about abandoning the tree as a metaphor. I think it works on, a, on the broad scale, but of all the human species that we've discovered so far, it's very difficult to put them on any sort of tree-like structure. We can't really draw the lines between any individual species as they've been traditionally known, although we, we now can say because of genomics that Neanderthals did successfully mate with Homo sapiens, and we know of the uh, an, another new species, the Denisovans, which was discovered in the last five years. Very few specimens, a couple of teeth and some and a finger bone. But we got the DNA out of that, um, got the genome out of that, and know that it's not the same as Neanderthals and it's not the same as us, and so it's another human species. So we, and we can position them on a geographical map, and we can position them on a chronological map, and we can also look at the proportions of people living today, extant people, and see how much DNA they carry of Denisovans. And what we see is that the further east you go, the more Denisovan DNA there is and the less Neanderthal DNA there is. And if you go back into Africa, you see almost no, you, you see no D Denisovan DNA and you see almost no Neanderthal DNA. The, 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 what we do see is from modern Europeans migrating back into Africa. So we can draw, well, we've effectively had to redraw the map of, of how early humans migrated and and, and spread all over the world over the past, you know, 250,000 years. So that's going way, way back, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years back. What can our DNA tell us now about, you know, where someone like you or I have come from? There's lots of services now. You can, uh, you can spit in a tube. You can get back this reading that says you're part German, part from here, part from there. Mm. What, what can we know about where our populations today have come from? It's a great question, and it's a tricky one to answer because... DNA will tell you such powerful things about immediate family and, and that more and more where people are discovering siblings and uncles and aunts and parents if they were adopted, particularly, particularly in this era when there were a lot of war babies. We can use DNA with great accuracy to identify immediate family. So it's very powerful in that regard, as, as in exactly the same way it is for identifying, for, for being used in forensics. But the further back you go, the dimmer the past becomes, and that applies to every bit of evidence that we, we use, and that includes DNA. And the way I think about this is that with two parents and four grandparents and eight great-grandparents and 16 great-great-grandparents and so on, on a full, uh, fully um, outbred family tree, the number of ancestors you have doubles every generation, right? So if you go back to 1066, which is almost 1,000 years ago, then on an outbred family tree, you have something like 100 trillion people. 
okay, that is more people than have ever lived on Earth. That, the math doesn't work, basically. No, it, it doesn't work at all. It's a thousand times more than the, people who, than the number of people who've ever lived on Earth. So we, we know, and we know that. We, that's not controversial to say. What we, so, so we figure that our family trees become pollarded and they overlap very soon in, in, the, in the f a few generations up. And then, if, if, if that's true, which it has to be because of the maths, there's, there's a concept called the isopoint, where um, family trees cross, where all family trees cross. And the isopoint for Europeans is around about the, uh, well, 15th century. So th there was, hypothetically and actually, uh, although we can't say who it was, a person who existed through which every single person's family tree flows. Every, every single European person has a common ancestor of about 500 years ago, which I find just absolutely bonkers. I, I found this mind-bending when I was reading the book. And there, there's so many amazing things in there. You like dig into the story of Richard III, you, you dig into the, the recent story about you know, Jack the Ripper, you're looking at where are we going, what can our DNA tell us? If there was kind of one thing in a, in a sentence that you could sum up about what you want people to take away from this book, like your, your takeaway point, what do you think that would be? I think it would be that, that humans are much more complex than we thought they were. And that, I think, is something worthy of celebration. And the second thing is that if people are trying to give you simple answers to complex pro problems, then they're probably selling something. And it's, it is the same answer. It's the same answer. But it, it, I'm not sure why we thought there would be simple answers to the questions of what, what makes us us, how we came to be what we are, when we are so beautifully complex. And for a long time, we thought there were going to be simple answers because I don't think we'd thought about it hard enough. And now what we find is that we're even more complex in terms of our genome than we are in terms of our behaviour. And that's exciting. Science writer Adam Rutherford and his book, A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived, is available in all good bookshops and online retailers. And if you're in need of another idea for a Christmas present for the genetics buff in your life, my own book, Herding Hemingway's Cats, Understanding How Our Genes Work, is out now too. You're listening to the Naked Genetics podcast with me, Dr Kat Arney. Still to come, our gene of the month has a festive flavour. But first... We've just wound the clock back to the beginning of human history. Now let's tick back to the very start of each individual human life, the moment of fertilisation when egg and sperm meet. In 1978, the world welcomed Louise Brown, the first test tube baby born by in vitro fertilisation, or IVF. Her birth sparked a heated debate about reproductive technology and, in particular, the use of human embryos for research purposes. This led to the so-called Warnock Report in 1984, based on the deliberations of a committee chaired by Baroness Mary Warnock, which in turn led to 1990 legislation establishing the UK Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority and a law banning research on human embryos grown in the lab for longer than 14 days. Until this year, this was thought to be quite a long period, as nobody was managing to grow embryos past six days or so, when they're a little football of cells known as a blastocyst. Then, in May 2016, Cambridge University's Professor Magdalena Zernitzka Gertz and her team managed to keep embryos growing in the lab for a staggering 13 days. So, should we change the law to go further and grow embryos for longer? I met up with Magdalena at a recent, and I'm afraid rather noisy, conference run by the Progress Educational Trust to discuss exactly this question. Well, when, uh, when successfully sperm meets the egg, the, the act of fertilisation happens and activation of the egg. And this is the time when you start to see the first divisions and they go on um, uh, like that until six day of development. So the big egg, you can say, is chopped up into smaller and smaller cells. And then um, when we have uh, quite a few of those cells, they start to decide their fate and differentiate. Their decision at that stage of life is either to form the future fetus or the placenta or the yolk sac. So they have three fate choices they have to make within these first few days. 
What we discussed today about is more focus on what happens in the next six days of their life, which was a black box of development until very recently, uh, when we now can directly look into this six extra days, so we double the time uh, at which we can look at the development and discover what happens to those three distinct type of cells when they start to talk to each other and prepare the foundation for the future baby. And how do you do this? How do you go from this little football of cells that we can see suspended in a dish to making them start to go that extra few steps? What happens? So essentially the, the, the key was that there was no culture system developed that would allow this embryo to survive outside the body of the mother. Uh, so what we have done is to find the right uh, environment, um, the right um, um, ingredients or the right hormones and growth factors which we then as a cocktail put into this environment to support the growth of these embryos in a dish. Because this would normally be a stage when the little embryo has, has started embedding in the womb and, and That's right. sorting itself out. Yes, so this would be normally uh, the time when the embryo will implant and get into the physical contact with the body of the mother and it was thought that this physical contact might be what is absolutely essential for its further development. So we showed that it's not so, right? That these embryos can develop outside the body of the mother for this extra six days. I'm sure that at that point on, they would be relying on the body of the mother for lots of different things, the most important nutrition. But since we provided them with the nutrition, they were able to self-organize themselves and progress in their development. And what we have shown, that they really go through these five critical steps of development in a correct way. So that's what's very important for us, not only show, not only see whether they can grow or not, but whether they actually take those decisions in expected way from what we know. You've grown these embryos now for 13 days in the system. Can you go any further? Uh, no, we can't go any further. So first of all, we do not know whether, um, uh, we, first of all, we don't want to go any further because there is a um, recognized law right now that you cannot go beyond the day 14th of development. So we stopped this one day before in the day 13. I even don't know whether if the if it were to change one day, I don't even know whether this culture system would be supporting development of the embryo beyond day 13. Why do you want to do this research? What would be the benefits of being able to grow embryos like this? Well, the first critical thing is to realise that we know so much about development of many other model organisms, fruit flies, um, worm, and we don't know much about development of our own embryos. We actually, at this stage of development, we have nothing like the knowledge. So we, this is all really black box of development. So of course we want to understand the principles which govern normal development at this stage to be able to understand what are the conditions um, that make those embryos developing correctly and what are the factors that we have to take into account when they do not develop correctly. So. A lot of it is to understand basic development and therefore curiosity, as each single scientist has, but also it has a tremendous uh, translational implication and uh, we discuss several of those uh, for IVF clinics but also for uh, treating um, uh, diseases that manifest themselves at this stage. Magdalena zernitska gertz from Cambridge University. The issues raised by her work are controversial and challenging. Just because we might be able to grow embryos longer than 14 days and with it discover important clues about early human development and what goes wrong in infertility, miscarriage and some types of cancer, does that mean we should? Sarah Norcross is the director of the Progress Educational Trust, whose December meeting brought together scientists, philosophers and even an ex-Archbishop of Canterbury to discuss this thorny question. We were thinking for our conference, what would be really interesting, what's the, what's the hot topic, we always have to look for hot topics. And um, Professor Azim Surani, um, who's a geneticist, who's done a lot of embryo research at Cambridge, he was discussing um, at our conference in 2015 um, about germline um, in relation to mitochondrial donation. And part of the sort of questions that came, one of the questions that came out from the audience was um, what about if you could extend the amount of time that you could do research on embryos for what, you know, would that be useful? Um, and he said yes. And we thought this was quite interesting and it did catch the media's attention. 
But then, um, when Magdalena Zernike Gertz, when her paper was published in Nature, saying that she'd managed to develop um, embryos in vitro for up to 13 days, we thought, yes, this is a really interesting topic, because in earlier this year, in January in 2016, um, that's when Cathy Nikan was granted a license by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority to do um, genome editing research in embryos. So because genome editing is, you know, is a very new technology, because we haven't started doing it in embryos in the UK yet, because Cathy's just got her license, it was, wow, you know, well, if they did extend the period for which you could experiment. On embryos what would that mean in terms of genome editing technology what would that what could that possibly help us with would it help us just with understanding the basic science of something that is so fascinating and fundamental to us all the very early stages of human development something that's little understood and what the scientists call the black box would it allow changes to be made in embryos that can then in effect eradicate disease because it will go from the germline so could we get rid of some conditions so you know there seem to be these possibilities or would it you know and then of course as soon as you start talking about those then people start thinking about enhancement and how far should we go with this should we put checks and balances in place and so i think it was really important to start discussing genome editing and how long we should allow research in embryos to go on for before we call time on it. What really struck me from today's meeting was that this really dates back to almost a very specific point in time, to the birth of the first test tube baby, Louise Brown, in 1978, and the public suddenly going, wow, we can, we can do this now. And then from that, so you can do IVF, you can put an egg and a sperm together in a test tube, it will form an embryo. Some of those will be viable, some of those will not be viable. You can implant some of them back in the womb. Some of them will grow to make a baby, some of them won't. What are some of the issues around researching in this area? And sh should we even be doing this? Well, I think there are many thousands of surplus embryos created through IVF and some patients choose to donate those for research and that's very laudable. And when you think about all the research that needs to be done, it's not just sort of what the next wow factor scientific um, development may be. And I guess just research into how to make IVF better and more successful. How to make IVF better is a real driver in this area because IVF, um, while it's a successful treatment for many, it does fail a lot as well. And, you know, the, the heartbreak that it causes people when it fails and also because 60% of people pay for their treatment in the UK the expense when it fails as well is huge so it's an emotional expense as well as a financial expense. When we're thinking about genetic modification of human embryos whether that's for research purposes or even potentially for human modification how important is it that you think the public understands what is going on because I think there have been some examples for example with GM technology and food where it's been presented as here here's this enjoy eat this stuff and people go what's in it I don't I don't, mm, don't like that um, how can we educate and inform the public about what really is going on here I think there are, there are huge lessons to be learned we're determined to um, as the progress educational trust to do something about that so we're we're starting to work on a project with with small workshops to understand how people understand genome editing so we're taking people who aren't scientists but who perhaps got an interest in fertility they perhaps work in a clinic or they are represent a patient group and to get them to um, give us their impressions about it to have scientists explain it to them and so that we can try and develop language of materials that will help a wider group of people um, understand um, the science behind it and to try and so that it can be explained to them in a way that's accurate but not so heavily encumbered with science, difficult scientific terminology that they can get their brain 
you know, brain round it, listening to it as a sound bite, because unfortunately, um, I know for me, um, you know, our time is so limited that, you know, we're trying to get to grips with an issue by reading something really quickly. So we even want to know about a paragraph at the most um, to think, oh, yes, I know about that now. And then I can form my opinion on that because it's similar to this or whatever else it is. Um, and also because, you know, there are, I think it's really important for scientists to speak to the public about their work, to get the public to understand what they're doing, you know, right from the beginning. Because I think otherwise people think wrongly that they're perhaps hiding things, that there's something secretive going on, that there's a conspiracy. You know, as soon as there's a, there's a silence and there's a lack of communication, people put that project things onto that, which is usually very, very negative. And so I think by being open and transparent and saying, when we're looking at this, this is early stage, it's not going to cure cancer, <laughs> it's not going to do this, but this is, what it, this, is, this is where we are and this is the start of something, people can understand that and appreciate that that's the way that science works. And I think that would be another important part of that to, for people to understand that you don't just come up, you know, with a light bulb moment that suddenly Eureka. cures something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Eureka, that's the word. And finally, when we're thinking about laws, so we heard today from uh, Baroness Mary Warnock, who was uh, one of the people who put together the legislation that says you can only go up to 14 days and, uh, and the establishment of the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority he here in the UK that regulates mm. human embryo work and, and human embryo research. Is it really just down to scientists to tell us what they want to do and, and you know, the public should just understand it and be okay with that? No, I don't think scientists do have the, sh and do or should have the um, authority, power, whatever we want to call it, to tell the public, this is what we're gonna do and we're gonna do it and you've gotta go along with it because it's science. They have to make the arguments for why it's important, and I, I really do firmly believe that, that they have to build a case for why we should change the law. We shouldn't just do it because we can, or we might like to, but they have to make some sort of justification. Um, you know, because as well as the sort of public engagement work that Progress Educational Trust does, we also do campaigning work. And I don't, I don't want to campaign for something just because someone thinks, oh, it's a bit of a whim. Yeah. I want to oh, this sounds like yeah, fun, this, or my yeah. evil plan. <laughs> yeah, my evil plan. So, you know, it, it's got, for me, it's got to have some um, value to society at the end to improve the choices for people who are affected by infertility and genetic conditions. Sarah Norcross from the Progress Educational Trust. And you can find out more about their work and the conference at progress.org.uk. And finally, it's time for our gene of the month, which is the gene, or rather the gene fault, responsible for Christmas disease. This was first described in a paper in the British Medical Journal in 1952 and named after the unfortunate child suffering from it, a five-year-old boy called Stephen Christmas, who bled profusely in response to the slightest injury. It's now known to be a rare disease called haemophilia B, and it's due to a fault in the gene encoding a protein called factor IX, which is involved in blood clotting, hence the unstoppable bleeding in people who suffer from it. Factor IX is part of the cascade of chemical reactions that end up chopping up a large molecule called fibrinogen to make a sturdy, insoluble protein called fibrin. This then forms a sticky net at the site of a wound, trapping blood cells and starting the clotting process. The gene for factor IX is carried on the X chromosome, one of the two sex chromosomes. This means that the disease usually only affects boys, who have one X chromosome carrying the faulty gene and one Y chromosome, as girls have two X chromosomes, so a fault on one can be balanced out by a functional gene on the other. In 2009, scientists in the US showed that Queen Victoria actually carried a faulty version of the factor IX gene on one of her X chromosomes, and three generations of boys in the British royal family were affected by haemophilia B, so it's sometimes known as the royal disease too. Today, Christmas disease is treated with injections of factor IX produced by genetically modified bacteria, but previously it was only treatable through blood transfusions. Sadly for Stephen Christmas, he contracted HIV through one of these transfusions before they were regularly screened for the virus, and he died of AIDS in 1993. So, at this time of year, 
spare a moment to remember the other meaning of Christmas. That's all for now. I'll be back next month with a look at some of the latest applications of gene editing technology. Until then, if you've got any questions or feedback, just email me at genetics at thenakedscientist.com. You can also get in touch through the Naked Scientist Facebook page or tweet me at Naked Genetics. Every episode of the Naked Genetics podcast is on iTunes and online at nakedscientist.com slash genetics. The Naked Genetics podcast is brought to you in association with the Genetics Society, online at genetics.org.uk. I wish you a peaceful and joyful holiday season and a very happy new year. I'll see you in 2017 for another peek inside your genes. <laughs>